Thank you very much, everyone. So uh, now we progress on to the second part of uh, the webinar. Um, and I'm afraid I do have to reintroduce myself because it is going to be split into two halves. So apologies if you're carrying on with the uh, webinar tonight, um, but you'll just hear me do the intro again. Uh, so as I mentioned at the start of the first um, webinar, I am Dr. Linda Strettle. Uh, I'm a GP partner in Rotherham, uh, working at the Village Surgery. And I became involved with um, at Target um, when I had some problems with multiple urine samples being dropped off um, at a previous practice I worked at. Um, and I found Target was a really evidence-based, clinically useful way to um, help find a way forwards with tricky antibiotic consultations and situations. Um, and it was practical and useful. Um, and we are all working so hard and we are desperate to find ways to make things a bit um, you know, sh easier and more effective and efficient. Um, and actually back up and delayed antibiotics prescribing until recently, I hadn't been that clear about how to do it and what to do and whether it was safe or efficient. Um, but actually the information I'm gonna present will hopefully show to you that it is a really useful option out there and it has a lot of support for safety too. Um, so um, the aims of this section is to talk through the evidence behind uh, delayed or backup prescribing of antibiotics, recognise when they are appropriate, quick and easy tips on how to explain it to the patient, learn different ways of doing it, there is more than one way, I didn't know that until uh, recently. Um, so the terms we use are actually really important here. Um, so I think as clinicians, we often think of um, antibiotic prescribing that's not immediate antibiotics, so as in have the antibiotics and start them now, um, as delayed prescribing. But actually, there's evidence that um, patients understand it more when you say backup prescribing. Other terms that people might use would be a deferred antibiotic, or a just-in-case antibiotic. And I suppose just to qualify that this is talking about um, simple infections, so respiratory tract infections, potentially UTIs, but in fairly straightforward situations. So not necessarily in a multi-morbid patient, not necessarily in somebody with long-term conditions like COPD. Um, and it's just a, important to be aware that this is really referring to simpler infections, such as respiratory tract infections. So why would we consider using an antibiotic backup prescription? So that's not giving the antibiotics immediately, but suggesting the patient to perhaps wait to, give a, to have an antibiotic. Well, actually, it's been shown that that can reduce the patient use of antibiotics. Um, it, can be it can be useful if you're unsure whether immediate antibiotics is actually needed. Um, so if you think that this is probably a viral infection, having that option of a, of a delayed prescription, a backup prescription can be a really nice option to help you feel more confident in the ending of that consultation. There's actually very little difference in symptomatic benefits for patients when you compare patients who are given an antibiotic to take straight away, so immediately, versus a patient who's given an antibiotic to take at a later point. This actually increases the patient's own ability to manage their infections and manage the, the symptoms themselves. It has been shown to be linked to a reduced complication rate when you compare backup and immediate versus no antibiotics. So actually giving no antibiotics has more complications than a backup prescription. So it can be a safer option. Um, and it reduces people coming back because they don't always necessarily take the antibiotics. And I'll go into more detail as we talk through it. And this was a really useful um, trial. Um, so this was in 2014 and it was a randomized controlled trial. And it was looking at effectiveness of strategies for delayed antibiotics for respiratory tract infections. And it looked at 889 patients over the age of three with an acute upper respiratory tract infection. And interestingly, even though I think we perhaps think that if we give patients a backup prescription, they would all take them, actually less than 40% of patients when they were given a backup prescription actually took them, which is really useful to know. So actually it, it is an option and it, it potentially can help, but actually not that many people all actually take them. And when you looked at the detail of this study, looking at the symptoms in the patients, 
there was very little difference in the severity of symptoms between those who were given delayed versus immediate antibiotics. There's very little difference in the duration of symptoms when they were given immediate or delayed antibiotics. And actually satisfaction ratings in both groups were very similar. So it's actually a really nice option. It's also really useful if you're unsure whether immediate antibiotics is needed. So this was a randomized control trial and um, looking at 11 GP practices um, and it randomized patients into three groups. So um, there was um, the red group, which were given immediate antibiotics at the time, and they were given 10 days of antibiotics for a sore throat. There was the green group who were given no antibiotics. And then there was the yellow group who were given delayed antibiotics. If you look at the first columns on the left, better by day three, there was actually no real difference between the three, group, three groups as to whether patients were better by day three. If you look at satisfaction, there was no significant difference between satisfaction ratings between the three groups. But interestingly, if you look at those who were given antibiotics, they were more likely to think that antibiotics would be effective. And then again, also the patients given antibiotics were more likely to come back again in the future. Whereas if you compare that to those who were given no antibiotics or delayed antibiotics, they were less likely to think that they were going to be effective in the future and were less likely to come back again. And there's a more recent study by Descartes, um, which showed that, again, the similar pattern showed itself. So actually 30 percent of patients who were given antibiotics that were delayed in that group didn't collect the antibiotics. The backups for antibiotics were useful for expectations for patients of wanting antibiotics. Um, but the satisfaction ratings in patients was often linked to patients having had their concerns addressed during that um, consultation. Interestingly, though, in the Descartes study, which was more recently done, um, there was more increased um, complications in the patients not given antibiotics at all. So safety wise, giving a delayed prescription can help reduce those complications compared to no antibiotics at all. And if we look at um, backup prescriptions as to why we might want to give them, um, overall, there's actually not that much difference in the symptomatic benefit with, with immediate versus backup prescriptions. And the reason for that is actually that antibiotics don't actually always cause that much benefit in lots of simple infections. So, for example, if we look at otitis media, the duration of untreated infection um, for most people can be between four and 12 days. The beneficial effect for the antibiotics can be eight to 12 hours. The number needed to treat for one additional benefit is 18. So you have to give 18 patients an antibiotic for one patient to benefit. But actually, if you treat nine patients, so the number needed to treat for an adverse effect, one of those will get an adverse effect. So much more people are getting an adverse effect compared to a benefit. And so it's useful to have that in mind when you're thinking about the usefulness of the antibiotic in the first place. And the NICE guidelines do fit nicely with this. And this is a really nice summary of all the antibiotic guidelines for all infections. And I have this saved to my desktop and I'd really encourage you to download it and have it there easy to hand. And it gives you there the guidance for when to consider a backup prescription. And it gives you the tools to help you decide. So, for example, this is the acute sore throat. It's got the key points, including the fever pain score, which antibiotic you would prescribe if you were going to, the doses and the duration of treatment. A really useful guideline to have there. And it's important, as I said in the start of this talk, to focus this on potentially delayed prescribing in those patients who are lower risk. So particularly if you look and say at the acute cough here in the circle, you can see the higher risk patients, including those who are young children who are born prematurely, people over 65 with two or more of, or people over the age of 80 with one or more of, hospitalisation, diabetes, heart failure or steroids, they're higher risk. So you're not necessarily going to go down the route of delayed prescribing in those more risky groups, but in your well otherwise no, more, no, no morbidity patient, these can be a really nice option. Interestingly as well, in, in a 2021 telephone study of over a thousand patients from the English general public, not many people are being given delayed prescriptions. 
So if this large study, 97% were not offered or given a delayed prescription, only 3% were. But if you look at that 3%, actually 59% of those didn't take the antibiotics. So the question is, are people out there open to this as an idea? Well, in this study, yes, they were. So 75% of those respondents felt that it was acceptable to be offered a delayed prescription. So not only is it something that can be useful, actually there's an appetite for it out there for patients to self-manage. And this um, looked at, again, whether people were more interested in this as an idea. And actually, if you look um, to the right of this, the percentage support ratings for a delayed prescription are increasing from 2020 to 2021. So patients are out there interested in this as an option. And this Cochrane um, Library uh, summary in 2017 reviewed 11 studies looking at delayed and backup prescribing. And it showed that um, there was a prevention of complications if you gave um, delayed prescribing compared to immediate and there was a reduction in reconsultation, so going back. Um, and we're all desperate to reduce demand at the moment. We're desperate to try and do as much as we can in one consultation. And so this can be part of that approach. And actually, if you do a delayed prescription, there's little or no difference compared to immediate prescribing in reconsultation, in adverse effects and in complications. So how do we explain or discuss this with patients? Well, we know there's two parts of this that are gonna help the patient more. The first one is talking through the reasons why you're considering it with the patient. So for example, you're acknowledging to them, it's not possible to necessarily predict how, what will happen next. And you want the patient to perhaps have access to those antibiotics if there's no improvement. And that fits into the first webinar. Um, and obviously, if you haven't listened to that, I would encourage you to go back and have a listen. Um, and particularly the part of the CHESS acronym that we're talking about, about the timelines, the shortcomings of antibiotics, the self-care and the safety netting. And this could be brought into that section too. And the second part, which helps a patient understand and accept the delayed prescribing, is the number of days to wait. And that needs to be tailored really to that patient to their history, to their other illnesses, and to their access. So the elderly patient who lives alone at home on a Friday, you're going to want them to have that antibiotic at home. But you might want to suggest to them, if they're a fairly well person, that they could wait you know, a little bit longer before they start the antibiotics to see if their symptoms might self-resolve. And this links in nicely to the leaflets that are on the target website on Accurates and on Ardens which helps support the antibiotic decisions that you're making. So how, could, how do we do this? And there are several different ways. So we can issue the prescription, but advise that they only get it dispensed if needed. So a lot of us work electronically. Um, I know that's not everywhere, but you can give them a physical prescription or send it to a chemist, but say, actually don't go and collect it until you feel you need it. You can do a post-dated prescription. Um, you can collect the prescription from agreed locations. So if you're not working with the patient there, if you're working remotely, you can send it to somewhere else. You can collect the antibiotic now. So you can say to that patient, the elderly patient on a Friday night, you know, get somebody to get the antibiotic or get it delivered, but perhaps don't take it straight away. Or you can ask the patient to contact the practice again to get the prescription. Out of these, I would probably say number five is less favorable for all of us. We don't necessarily want more phone calls into the practice, but the other options, there's certainly lots of different ways of doing it. And I'd probably encourage you to think about asking the patient to take the responsibility to themselves. So either sending it to the chemist or you know, passing it on to them to take that responsibility. And don't forget to code that you've done this. So this helps us see what's going on. It helps you audit your practice. Um, and there's various codes on there. And these will all be on the target website afterwards if you need to access them. Um, so when will we consider this? If you're uncertain about how an infection might progress, if the patient remains concerned about the illness progression, despite discussing the problems with antibiotics, and if you're concerned that the patient may need antibiotics, but they'll have limited access to medical care for whatever reason. So in summary, 
I think these are the worries that people have about delayed prescribing and backup antibiotics, that they might be less effective compared to no, no prescription in reducing antibiotic intake. So if I give this delayed prescription, well, they're just all going to take it. So what's the point of, of, of kind of delaying it? I may as well just give them an immediate prescription or, or you know, give them nothing at all. Well, actually, there is slightly higher rates of antibiotic use for backup, but it's nowhere near as high as you might expect. Backup will reduce the number of patients who come back to see you as well. So it, it kind of, as I showed in that table and chart, um, it helps the patients understand that actually antibiotics may not be effective and they may not come back. Medically, legally, what are the consequences? What are the complications of backup prescribing? Well, actually, there's a similar reduction in complications with backup and immediate antibiotics. So it doesn't mean that patients are more likely to have com complications. There's actually less complications in backup and immediate antibiotics compared to no antibiotics. So actually it's safer than no antibiotics. And there's two large cohorts to show that this is the case. So this isn't just small numbers. This is big numbers to prove that. And does it take more time? Well, possibly yes. But if you think about long term, if you do the time in that first consultation, hopefully they won't come back. They will self-care in the future. Um, and it may result in less consultations for that illness and future illnesses too. And it's part of good practice. And the key difference is to advise about when to consider it cashing it in. Again, thank you so much, all of you, for all that you're doing. And I hope that this could maybe open up a possible option for your consultations in the future. I hope that's been useful and we will open it up now for further discussion. Thank you so much, Linda. That was absolutely brilliant. I think a lot of the questions that were in the chat um, have already been answered as part of the webinar. If you don't feel that your question was answered and we said it would be, then do please ask again um, and, and we'll respond to it. We have five minutes. We said we'd finish at 7.30. Before I go into the Q&A, um, I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to all the healthcare professionals out there who have worked so hard in ridiculous hours over the past the past two years and are continuing to do so and, and that said on behalf of, of all of us here it's something that we we have discussed a lot when we were um, putting these webinars together and just to emphasize that we're here the whole point of us doing this is to support you so do please get in contact with us um, Linda would you mind going to the previous slide a second um, do please contact us you can Email us directly at targetantibiotics at phe.gov.uk or follow us on Twitter at the target um, ABX. And I think Camilla is going to send these details to you afterwards. So if you've got any questions or any ideas of things that you would like to support, um, facilitate antimicrobial stewardship in your practice, then do please get in contact with us. And before everything shuts down, I also wanted to say a huge thank you to the panel members, because I believe things shut down quite suddenly um, in these webinars. So just thank you to Monzi, Ola, Steve, and a massive thank you to Linda for presenting as well. I'm not going to lie, we did have some questions put aside just in case there was no engagement. Um, but we've had huge engagement um, in the questions. So I'm going to go straight to some of the questions that, that were asked. Um, B. Isa asked, how do you issue a backup prescription during remote consultations? Linda, Steve, any guidance on that? Um, well, to be honest, I would probably push the responsibility onto the patient. Um, we can't really have the time for them coming back to the practice. We don't want more phone calls in. Um, so I would potentially discuss it as an option with the patient, but encourage them to hang on, either to collect the prescription or when they collect it, to not take it immediately. Um, particularly if they're elderly or it's a Friday or it's an out of hours consultation. So I think you can still use it in lots of different contexts, but it's just that discussion with them not taking it immediately. Um, and that will hopefully allow them to start the self-care and see whether that actually the, the infection will improve on its own. But you've also safety netted and got them covered just in case. Steve, do you got anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I would say is that I, I usually say, look, I'm sending a prescription through now. You know, it's your choice as to when you start taking it. I recommend if it's for a respiratory infection, 
then, um, then you know, we know that this is a, a low respiratory infection. It's going to take three weeks to get better. There's no point in saying wait two days. You've got to wait six days or seven days before you start taking, unless things start getting worse, in which case you want them to call back again. But I think the thing I, I tend to emphasize, I'm sending it uh, as deferred prescription, a delayed prescription, but I don't think you need it now. I don't want you to start it yet. Ultimately, it's your choice if you just, you know, if, if, if you get the sense that someone really wants to start it. I recommend, I think your body's coping okay at the moment. So all that reassuring stuff that we spoke about, you know, your body's doing okay at the moment, it's coping quite well, let it heal itself. And if it's not going in the right direction, as we expect, then start, but give it six days. Um, and if you're feeling worse, contact us again. So, so that's strong um, encouragement to, to delay and that you're not recommending that they use it now. Okay. And I believe one of the other ways that you can do it is actually write a note. There's a, uh, for, for electronic prescriptions, um, that you can write a note to the pharmacist. You can mention something on the note to say, don't issue this or whatever. And in fact, Shan Humphreys, one of the pharmacists who are on the call said, from a pharmacist's perspective, it would be very useful for a note on the script to state it is intended for delayed use, as any script produced says three days plus should prompt a query to the GP and in doing so may delay treatment. So thank you for that, Shan. That was, was really useful. Um, one of the other questions, oh, one of the comments actually from Erica, Linda, your video on sore throat, such a good idea. Um, people want it. So would you mind sharing the link with um, yeah. Ella and she'll it, send it as part of the evaluation? It comes well. from um, EGP Learning. So there's um, a guy called Gandhi uh, does EGP Learning. It's on the Facebook groups. Uh, he's got his own Facebook group. And um, yeah, it's really nice. It's quick and you can email it because then because I know everyone will find you get a, a photo of a throat and it's um, the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't see anything and um, but yet yeah, it shows them how to take a breath in and get the lighting right absolutely no problem brilliant um from maya james if patients don't use the backup script for the episode is there any evidence they use it at a later date for something else um i think i'll comment on this so the survey that i've mentioned in in one of the in some of the questions as a survey that we do with the general public. We ask them, and, and one of the slides that Linda presented, we ask them if they've been offered a delayed prescript and if they take it. What we don't actually ask them or haven't until now is do they keep it for something else? So Maya, thank you for flagging that up. We will ask it in the February survey this year. I don't know, Monze or Ola, do you have any evidence from your research on this? Well, we don't we didn't look at that specifically in our research, but I know that there was a, a study uh, a few years ago where they um, identified that patients that did a so part of the household survey. They also asked patients about um, how many antibiotics they had um, accumulated or still had in stock from previous incomplete prescriptions or didn't start. And so we know that there are some you know people who do keep them or don't dispose of them in a tiny man manner but we don't know we don't have any up-to-date figures and actually um, what that is um, and I think certainly one of the problems is actually getting data on how much how much is used by patients because it, as you all know it's not really coded very well at the moment which is why we're trying to promote the idea of you know when you're you are issuing a delayed deferred backup prescription um, to code it so then we can actually get better data about how often it's used in practice, how then how often it's actually um, uh, used by patients as well by doing further research in this area. I think, Donna, the other thing to bear in mind is this is part of a long term battle, a war, really, that we, we're fighting and we're turning patients into stewards, antibi antimicrobial stewards as well. And I think that, the, the you know, I've, I've had a patient today, for example, a child is the third time we've had the same conversation. The parents was very, very easy this time round, and they also don't want to give antibiotics to their child because of those conversations we've had. So I think even if you look at once or twice, people might do it. But by the time they get accustomed to this, we're practicing, I think they'll also start to buy into why it's so important to use antibiotics wisely. But that leads me to a question from Matilda. Um, she asked, is there a recommended minimum age for suggested backup prescription, for example, respiratory infection in very young children, perhaps under twos? She's wary and would prefer they, re they represent, would appreciate the panel's view. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that I very rarely use uh, children. If children need antibiotics, to my mind, they need to be in hospital. So children in the community shouldn't should almost never get antibiotics. But look, I'm probably at one extreme end. There are nice guidelines around antibiotics for otitis media. So I think that would be the one situation where I don't, again, we're giving antibiotics to children who've got a very delicate microbiome and we, we wiping that out uh, and they're not eating fiber and all the other stuff that adults eat to try and recolonize that quickly. And I, I think, you know, we really don't know what harm we're causing in giving antibiotics to young children. So I think we, we give them only when we feel that this is absolutely necessary. Someone who's got a pneumonia or a severe, you know, severely distressed child. But I think a tightest media is one way you, where I would certainly, if, if there's a lot of discomfort and pain, get, use a deferred antibiotic. For respiratory infections, I don't think there are many situations where a child in the community should have an antibiotic for a respiratory infection, but um, shoot me down if you want. Okay, and last question before we leave. Sorry for everybody else who's still answer, asking questions, but one from Mansuri. Um, does ordering microbiological tests help satisfy your patients about not having antibiotics? So having that backup from, from microbiology. Ooh, yeah. uh, <laughs> well, I suppose it's what test you're asking for. So actually, I know there's not that much evidence from my knowledge for swabbing throats for um, treating for um, infections. So I don't think swabs would help anyway, because lots of people carry strep in their throat anyway. Um, urine, in, urine samples and taking them for infection. Well, you really need to look at the target guidelines because actually you need to be correctly assessing to see if a urine sample is indicated because a lot of the time particularly in elderly people you will get um, asymptomatic bacteria anyway um, so I don't I use it in a targeted manner target target sorry um, but I use it in a in a in the right patient um, to help me decide um, in a well patient whether antibiotics are indicated um, but I don't use it for reassurance particularly yeah. I think the other way is reframing the argue, reframing the discussion. You know, it's not about whether you've got a viral or bacterial illness, because of course a lot of uh, bacterial bronchitis will clear. Our body's designed to fight all sorts of organisms, and it, I don't think that necessarily matters. The question is, does your body need help at the moment, or is it coping uh, to get better on its own? And so I think that it, we might find a bacteria that's the cause of your otitis media or your uh, um, bronchitis. The question is, do you still need an antibiotic? And I don't think that you know, all the other the information that we're collecting alongside that is more useful, uh, our clinical information, than a, back, than a result of a, of a laboratory test. Fabulous. Um, and Mark, sorry, th this is the end, really. But Mark has made a very valid comment about spending years educating patients and then COVID has come along and there's lots and lots of issues. How long does the panel think it will take to undo this damage? One of the things I would say here is that we have got a general public who are more open and more educated about science and, and their own health than we have ever had before. And I think now, and this is just me personally speaking, this isn't evidence-based, this is just me. I think now is a perfect time for us to be able to try and educate the general public about the appropriate use of antibiotics. I think they're open and they're receptive. And, um, and I think we, we can only try. Um, and on that note, I'm going to say thank you everybody for attending tonight. And um, we will try and answer these questions and send and lent, or Camilla hopefully will send everything around to everybody. Um, do sign up for the Target newsletter if you want more information about what we've been doing and let us know, fill in the evaluation form. Let us know what other webinars you think you might like to come from Target in the future. Thank you everyone for attending and um, have a lovely evening.